a good time to start. Good morning, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Adele Kroch, and um, I'm one of the partners in Food Focus. As you know, Linda Jackson very well, and some of you also know Bridget Day. And the three of us together own Food Focus. I'm based in France, a very, very chilly France at the moment. And um, it really warms my heart to know that I'm speaking to all of you guys in warm, sunny South Africa. And um, I hope everybody can hear me. If you can't hear me, and currently what you need to see on your screen is the slide um, saying that what we are talking about today, the one that says cannabis infused food. So please, if you do not see that, um, just uh, raise your hand or ask me a question and then um, I, I will uh, um, look into it why you can't see me. Okay, so just for making clear everybody understands how it will work today, um, we have got um, the Janusz on the line, like I said, from Han and Han, and um, we're very happy that we've got him to talk to us about this very interesting topic. And I just want to make sure, if you can't hear me, just make sure that your speakers are up and on and loud so um, that your sound on your side is handled by your computer. Then we don't have telephone um, phoning in um, abilities today, unfortunately. Um, to see the screen nicely, it's best for you to click on your maximize button at the upper right corner of the slide. And then um, if you want to let it go back to normal again, you just click on restore. This webinar definitely um, is being recorded and um, the recording will be made available on our website. If you go to the Food Focus website, at the top you will see a button that says resources <clears throat> and under resources there's webinars. On that button you will um, see upcoming webinars as well as webinars that we've already hosted, where you will then be able to um, see the recording of it afterwards. So we can also um, send a link to you um, after uh, we've um, you know, put the recording together. So look out for that as well. Then the way that you will be communicating with me is if you look at your screen, that you see, um, you will see there's like an orange background with a white button on it, and then it says audio and questions. So uh, please be so kind throughout the presentation. If any questions come up for you, please type it into that question um, uh, bar and then send it through to me. Then it will come through to me, and then um, I will make sure to ask Janish the questions um, at the end of the presentation. And if you are on a mobile phone, then you will see on the top of your screen, there's a little question mark. And um, if you press there, then you can also ask a question. So um, it gives me great pleasure now to um, hand it over to Janusz. And I'm, like, I'm going to ask Janusz to introduce himself um, because um, I'm sure that he knows exactly what he would like to say about his past and where he's working and his company. So Janusz, um, if you accept my request, you can open, fantastic, we can see your slide, and all over to you. Thank you very much, and uh, that's, uh, glad to be talking to you again and to be presenting this this morning. So what's to say about myself? Well, you can see from the slide, I'm an engineer who worked in the food industry before I became a lawyer, I then also became a patent attorney, so I do deal with innovative food products, uh, cannabis, I suppose, products. I'm a partner at Han and Han Attorneys. Um, I've been in the food industry for quite a long time, uh, first as an engineer and now as a lawyer. And I think I have a very good understanding of the situation as it relates to the topic we're speak to, to speaking about today. I'm also a member of the Food Lawyers Network, which is largely a European-based network of food lawyers. And I can tell you that the debate there is just as uh, uh, loud and just as, uh, how can I say, critical of what's happening as it is in South Africa, because the regulators are really not in a position to simply approve products. And therefore, 
the market seems to be ahead of what is being allowed. And in different countries in Europe, different things are allowed. So let's get straight on to what we want to talk about today regarding South Africa. So this is brought to you by, by our firm, Hahn and & Hahn. And as you can see, we combine law and engineering and food science. All right. So let's first talk about cannabis, hemp, CBD, and THC, just to clarify what these topics are, what do, they, what do these words mean? So cannabis and hemp are both varieties of the same cannabis sativa. The cannabis or marijuana, as people refer to it, has the higher concentration of THC than CBD and is in fact the cyber, uh, psychoactive one. Hemp, of course, has a higher concentration of CBD than THC uh, and is less psychoactive and ideally should have virtually no THC. Cannabis uh, has been allowed in South Africa by a constitutional court case for cultivation and private use. And we're going to talk a lot about private use because a lot of products are being on sale you know when it's on sale it's not private use so the constitutional court ruled in september 2018 that cultivation for private use is permitted not for commercial use commercial use of any type would require legal cannabis to have been used i.e the south african health products regulatory authority has to issue a cultivation license and it has to be cultivated legally Let's look at the timeline of how things have changed and how things are developing, because the development, as law goes, is rather quick. So, in 18, before 18 September 2018, all cannabis was illegal in South Africa. You could go to jail for possessing marijuana. Then on 18 September 2018, the Constitutional Court ruled that private cultivation and private use is legal. Um, of course, the laws have to be amended to put that into effect, but they stopped prosecuting people. Then on 23rd of May 2019, the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority issued two regulations under the Medicines Related Substances Act. So not under the Foods Act, not under any other law, those two regulations under the Medicines Act. A year uh, later, 22 May 2020, the South African Health Product Regulatory Authority issued a stakeholder communication and a new regulation on how CBD, THC and cannabis will be dealt with under the Medicines and Related Substances Act. Very importantly, Medicines and Related Substances Act. Then on 7 August 2020, there was a memorandum and a draft cannabis for private purposes bill published. So this is the law that many cannabis proponents were waiting for, which was supposedly now going to open the doors and legalize trading cannabis and lead us into a bright green, few, hazy future. But as you'll see further on, in fact, it's done anything but that. And if anything, it's clamping down on commercial use. Uh, 17 September was then the constitutional court decision deadline for a new law to be passed. But obviously, because of the coronavirus, etc., they took extensions. And 30 November 2020 was the deadline for public comment on the draft cannabis for private purposes bill. Currently, that bill still has to be uh, uh, deliberated in Parliament and, in fact, is not law. So, as the law stands at the moment, R586 and the Medicines and Related Substances Act are the last word on legal use. And of course, the Drug Trafficking Act speaks to illegal use. So there's your timeline. So let's talk about the Medicines and Related Substances Act, because obviously I've highlighted it a lot and it's really important. So we need to understand that under the Medicines and Related Substances Act, uh, there are two, uh, uh, you get a classification of medicine and underneath medicine is complementary medicine. You will note the word medicine is there and the word medicine is there. If you are not a medicine, you can be a foodstuff and then you don't fall under the Medicines and Related Substances Act, you fall under the Foodstuffs, Cosmetics and Disinfectants Act. There is no overlap. You know, you hear people speak of, oh, and Aristotle or whoever said, let food be thy medicine and so on. That's all lovely. But the reality is that in terms of our law, you're either a food or a medicine. There's no crossover. So what is a medicine? It's any substance or mixture of substances used, and here's important words, or purporting to be suitable for use 
or manufactured or sold for use. So something can be a medicine not because it's a medicinal compound as such, but because you claim it has a medicinal effect. And of course, it's used in diagnosis, treatment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A foodstuff is any article or substance except a medicine. So you'll see there's no overlap. And it's something that is ordinarily or eaten, drunk by a person, or purporting or suitable to be manufactured or sold for human consumption. So we know what a food is, we know what a medicine is. So under the Medicines and Related Substances Act, we have the following developments. The South African Health Product Regulatory Authority replaced the old Medicines Control Council. They had to then deal with the issue of supplements and complementary medicines and a regulation R859 was published on 25th of August, 2017, which defined what complementary medicines were and defined what supplements were. And it introduced a new definition of complementary medicines, which says, A, it can originate from plants, for example, cannabis, used or purporting to be suitable for use or sold for use in maintaining, complementing, or assisting the physical or mental state of the human body or it is used as a health supplement. So you can immediately see that many, many CBD products, cannabis products fall squarely within this definition. They also introduced a new definition for a health supplement, and I don't really want to go much into this, but it comes down to when you're selling things in capsules, you're selling things in take one per day, dilute one sachet in water per day, and then you claim it complements somebody's health. So, Somebody in the audience is going to say, oh, but there was a court case, and the court case said this definition is invalid. There was a court case called the Alliance of Natural Health Products in South Africa, and the defendant was the Minister of Health, and there is SACRA. What the court case ruling said was that the definition of medicine, the one I've just showed you, is declared to apply only to substances that are used or purported to be suitable for use or manufactured or sold for use, in diagnosis or treatment, mitigation, modification, or prevention of maladies in order to achieve a medicinal or therapeutic purpose in human beings or animals. So the judge tried to rewrite Section 1 of the Medicines Act to have a different definition. And also uh, the judge spoke to declaring unlawful the extent that they apply to complementary medicines and health supplements and are not medicines. So most people stop here. They say, ah, it's all invalid. It's all illegal. So actually those regulations don't bother us. We should be able to carry on selling. What they forget is the judge then said, the declaration of invalidity is suspended for a period of 12 months to allow SACRA an opportunity to correct the defect. So first of all, for 12 months from the date of this court case, um, in fact, the current law stands. The fact that the judge ruled that, in fact, it should mean something else has been suspended for 12 months. So where we sit today, the current law, as it was written, as I presented to you, is in fact the law. But what we must also not forget is that this judge's ruling, which is a single judge in the High Court, was actually appealed and is currently on appeal. And the way that law works is when you appeal a judgment, the effect thereof is suspended. Particularly when it comes to medicines, there have been court cases where companies have challenged the decision of SACPRA, went on appeal, and then the courts have ruled that while the appeal is pending, you must follow the law as it stood before the ruling because it's in the interest of public health. If you err and make an error, rather err to keep things as they are than err to change things later realizing them wrong and having to change them back so but the other aspect that we need to understand is whereas health supplement manufacturers those that make the bodybuilding proteins and whatever think this is a great ruling if you are in the cbd cannabis business in fact if this law is upheld it can be very problematic for you because in terms of the regulation I'm going to speak about now, which is, excuse me, the regulation relating to CBD and THC and cannabis, if you are not in fact a complementary medicine, then you don't fall under that regulation, you may not sell your product at all, as I'm going to explain to you. 
So in fact, if you're in the cannabis industry, you're probably holding your fingers crossed that the appeal will succeed, and in fact, the law will stand as it stood. So in terms of the complementary medicines regulations, if you sell one of these products, which would include a cannabis product, which helps for anxiety or helps you sleep or one of those issues, you have to follow the following labeling pre uh, prescriptions, which says you have to say it's a category D medicine, what type of medicine, it, what it relates to, you have to have specific packaging, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not gonna go in detail through this, you can read this yourself. There are specific labeling requirements. You have to state that it's a complementary medicine. You have to state that if it's not registered, you have to say it's an unregistered medicine that has not been evaluated by SACRA for its quality, safety, or intended use. And funny enough, just like in foodstuffs, if you have more than 5% GMOs, you have to have a warning that it contains GMOs. Now, we all know cannabis is not GMO. But if you have a compounded product, you may have cannabis inside a carrier capsule, which has got corn flour, and the corn flour may be GMO, in which case you would have to put a GMO label on your product. Um, if, you have, if you have a mixture of substances, so you've got your cannabis and it's combined with some sort of scheduled substance, you have to list, list the scheduled substance. Um, if it's got an application number or a registration number, you must place that on the packaging and you've got to say what category of medicine it is. You have to say what the dosage form is. It's a capsule, it's a tablet, it's a powder. What is it? Uh, the approved name of each active ingredient and the quantity thereof contained in a dosage unit. So it's no longer like a foodstuff where you simply list the ingredients without any quantities. If you are a complementary medicine, you have to use the approved name for each ingredient and the quantity of each ingredient per suitable mass or volume unit. Um, so it's quite important. People now know exactly what's in your product. If there's any preservatives, you have to list the preservatives. Uh, if there's any antioxidants, you've got to state what they are. So the minimum labeling requirements on PAC are that you need full requirements to apply to the outer packaging. And but very importantly, you'll see at the bottom, no gratuitous marketing information on the packaging. What I mean by that is the law prescribes what has to be on the label. You're not allowed to put anything else on the label, despite how you may feel about it. It is what it is. If you want to put other information, you have to get permission from the authorities to add other information. So product examples uh, are products which, which make claims that they complement your health, they supplement your diet, they have a nutritional effect. And these, of course, would include CBD containing supplements, which, for example, claim to help with pain or stress or sleep or any other such things. These would all be considered complementary medicines under the complementary medicines regulations. So. Until the regulations in 2019, Medicines and Related Substances Act had all cannabis, hemp, CBD, and THC for human consumption as what is called a Schedule 7 medicine. In fact, it's criminal offense to possess it unless it's been specifically prescribed and administered to you. Then in 2019, as I mentioned, according to my timeline, they said, okay, CBD will be moved from this very prohibitive Schedule 7 and all CBD containing products become Schedule 4. Schedule 4 is like an antibiotic. You just need a doctor's prescription. And then they said, okay, but we'll, we'll relax it a bit further. And if you have a very low CB, very low dose CBD containing product, please note, no THC, very low CBD dose containing product, then in fact, it becomes a health supplement. Please note, it doesn't become a foodstuff. It becomes a health supplement and has to comply with the health supplement regulations. Then, so, so these regulations, which were the 2019 ones, I'm not gonna go through them, but they, they basically said you could have a 20 milligram per day dose and only accepted low risk claim or health claims were allowed. You couldn't make claims to any specific diseases, to health, uh, um, health maintenance or relief of symptoms. And then they also dealt with processed products. I'm not going to go into this one because this is now the previous regulations. But you'll see that they had a 0.001% of THC. Now, 0.001 THC is one fiftieth of what is allowed in the USA. So in the USA, 
CBD may have 0.03%, one decimal less than in South Africa. And any product that you made from raw processed product could not have more than 0.0075% total CBD. Now, immediately you can see that this is not something you can do in your kitchen at home because you would need to analyze things to know what percentages you had. Then in 22 May 2020, in the middle of the harshest lockdown we've had, R586 was published. And R586 said, CBD will be removed from Schedule 4 if it is a complementary medicine, very important, it's a complementary medicine, it's not a foodstuff, containing no more than 600 milligrams cannabidiol per sales pack, providing a maximum daily dose of 20 milligrams of cannabidiol and making a general health enhancement, low maintenance or relief of minor symptoms claim. So it's a complementary medicine. Because it's a medicine, you can in fact make general health enhancement claims, health maintenance claims, or relief of minor symptoms, the so-called low risk claims. The 20 milligram daily dose is still there. And they said no more than, basically one pack cannot be more than one month supply. And then they said, if you want to use, if you want to make processed products, Let's say, I assume a bar of chocolate, a beverage maybe, and it's, then it must be made from cannabis raw plant material. It can't be made from a CBD powder. Then it's got to be made from cannabis raw, raw plant material, which is intended for ingestion. And again, it contains less than 0.0075% or less of cannabidiol, and only the naturally occurring quantity of cannabinoids found in the source material may be contained in the product. But please note, these are still under the Medicines and Related Substances Act. It's not a foodstuff. It's effectively a chocolate medication. You know, you get gummies with vitamins for children. You get, so it's a form of, of the product that's being allowed, but it still falls under the Medicines Act. And very importantly, these are still regulated as Schedule Zero. When you see the word schedule, in the context of medicines, you know it's a medicine. Medicines are scheduled between schedule zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So these types of products are schedule zero, but they're nonetheless a medicine, they're not a foodstuff. So the very, very important difference between the 2019 regulation and the 2020 regulation, um, that they now also stipulate that it's now a category D medicine, uh, not only do they stipulate daily dose limits, but also maximum pack sizes. But very importantly, it's not a foodstuff. So under the 2019 regulation, there was some doubt. People argued, oh, but the processed products are in fact foodstuffs. You can make a pizza with cannabis. But now it's been made very clear. If you include cannabis or CBD or THC, you are in fact a Schedule Zero medicine. SACPRA then concluded in their documentation, access to cannabis-related products for medicinal purposes remains subject to the requirements of the Medicines and Related Subject Substances Act. It didn't become a foodstuff. And then they issue a warning. Any CBD-containing products which do not meet the specifications listed above will remain subject to control measures applicable to Section to Schedule 4. Now, Schedule 4 is the ones that you need a doctor's prescription for. And it's a criminal offense to sell it to someone without a doctor's prescription. You can't walk into a pharmacy and demand sleeping tablets or an antibiotic without a prescription. The pharmacist could be prosecuted and jailed if he sold it to you. What they are saying, if you exceed the limits I just read to you and you sell it to the public without a prescription, then you are in fact committing a criminal offense. Any person importing a CBD containing product in terms of this exclusion notice will need to provide proof of the CBD and or THC content of the product. And of course, these products include various products. They include oils, supplements, gums, high concentration extracts, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that was the bad news relating to the Medicines and Related Substances Act. Let's talk about cannabis for private purposes, Bill, and where we are going. So this was the bill I spoke to you about in the beginning, and it's already been approved by Cabinet for the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services. It still requires a parliamentary discussion and deliberation 
which su supposedly was going to be prioritized for this year. We're in February, I suppose it can still take, it can still happen. So the aims of the bill are to respect the right of privacy of an adult person to possess cannabis plant cultivation material, to cultivate, keyword here, yeah, a prescribed quantity of cannabis plants. You can't start an indoor greenhouse and grow thousands of cannabis plants and to possess a prescribed quantity of cannabis. Again, you can't possess hundreds of kilograms of compressed cannabis and it's your right to consume cannabis. This bill wants to regulate the possession of cannabis plant material, the cultivation of the plants, the possession of the cannabis by an adult person, no children. Now in South Africa, an adult is anyone over 18 in case you didn't know. It, it is to protect adults and children against the harm of cannabis, so it's uh, drug, drug abuse or whatever. And they provide for the expungement of criminal records of persons convicted of possession or use of cannabis. So what they want to do, if historically you were convinced, co convicted as a user, not as a peddler, not as a, as a pusher, but if you were convicted for possessing a little bit of cannabis, your criminal record will disappear. And then to amend other laws. There are some very important definitions. They define cannabis. Um, one of the important definitions, obviously we know what the plant is, any substance that contains THC is considered to be cannabis. And fresh cannabis, dried cannabis, and cannabis concentrates are classes of cannabis. They have a cannabis plant, means a plant of the genus cannabis. So it would normally include hemp, but they specifically say, but excludes hemp. Very important. But immature cannabis plants and flowering cannabis plants are cannabis plants. And then it says seeds of a cannabis plant are cultivation material. Cannabis product means anything that is intended for human or animal consumption, which contains THC or any other phytocannabinoid found in a cannabis plant. So any cannabis product would be the things we've been speaking about under the Medicines and Related Substances Act. Then they talk about what is a commercial quality, a commercial quantity, and they had, uh, I'm sorry to see where it is. Uh, oh, okay, that's a commercial quantity. This is defining, they want to have a definition of when is it a commercial quantity and when is it a private quantity. I saw somewhere 600 grams per adult. I'm not sure if I've got it in the slide presentation. Um, is considered to be for private use. I don't know how many plants it was, and we'll see how it comes out when the bill's finally passed. And then consumption or consume means to smoke, eat, drink, or otherwise to self-administer cannabis. So potentially it excludes cosmetics. Cannabis, including cosmetics, may be excluded under this. Hemp means a plant of the genus cannabis, which has a concentration of THC in the leaves and flowering heads, that does not exceed the percentages may be prescribed of and is cultivated under authority of a law that regulates its cultivation. Now, at the moment, that would be a law they still have to write. Under the Medicines and Related Substances Act, that is THC below 0,001%. Very, very, very low. So they create three types of three types of criminal offences under this bill, which supposedly is there to legalise cannab cannabis. If you read the press, one criminal offence is to cultivate cannabis. Um, there's a, a offence relating to, to possession of cannabis and other things that you do with cannabis, and there's an offence relating to consumption of, of cannabis. And the cannabis offences are any person who is in possession in a public place. So if you want to use cannabis privately, you've got to use it at home. If you're in a public place, you, you're already looking for trouble. And there'll be a prescribed quantity that you're allowed in a, in a public place, and that amount will be less than a trafficable amount. A trafficable amount, obviously, is an amount which they expect that you're actually selling to other people. Or if you possess a commercial quantity of cannabis, then you will be guilty of the highest offense. And then it says an adult person is in possession in a private place, in other words, in your house, of a quantity that exceeds uh, the maximum amount can also be, be guilty of a, of a criminal offense. So don't think you can do anything you want at home. 
and an adult person in possession of cannabis at any place and who fails to source store such cannabis in a secure space that is inaccessible to a child. So if you have cannabis at home and you have children at home, you have to keep the cannabis locked up. And you store the cannabis in such a way that effectively it can be accessed by people, you're also guilty of an offense. An adult person who obtain, who provides or obtains from an adult person without the exchange of remuneration can be guilty of an offense. So somebody giving you cannabis can result in an offense. And then somebody who deals in cannabis is, is guilty of an offense. Now, there are different classes of offenses and they result in different prison terms. But all of these are nonetheless criminal actions. Transporting cannabis in a vehicle on a public road, this like should remind you of the lockdown and transporting alcohol. If you're transporting cannabis in a vehicle, even if it's a private quantity, you may already be guilty of an offense. And if you transport it, it's got to be in a, it's got to be concealed in public view if you are possession of it in a public place. So th this law, which people believed, oh, now it's going to open up industry, it's going to create legalized cannabis, it's going to be like buying beer. Well, you're wrong. Uh, they are, in fact, going to only open the door a crack, a small crack. And I don't mean crack as in a crack pipe, I mean a crack, a small opening so that you can use it personally at home and potentially in some public places, maybe like in Netherlands, maybe in a coffee shop or something. And then any person who consumes cannabis in or near or uh, in, in at or near any place prescribed by regulation where the consumption of cannabis is prohibited will be guilty of an offense. That will be things like schools, creches, where children are around, etc., will be guilty of an offence. Any person who consumes cannabis in a vehicle on a public road is guilty of an offence. You can't be driving smoking a Zor. It's a criminal offence. It's the same as driving drinking a bottle of vodka. <laughs> oh, yeah. And there are classes of offences. So, class A offence. 15 years or a fine and such in prison. Class B offence. Six years. Class C offense, four years, and a class D offense, two years. So as you can see, if you're committing any of these offenses that I've been through over here, this is going to be serious stuff. I don't think that they've now opened it up, up the world to you to go crazy with your cannabis. And obviously selling a food stuff with cannabis in it will fall under exactly this. Don't believe they're talking only about a Zolia. When they're talking about selling somebody a cannabis, if you're selling somebody a chocolate with cannabis in it, it's cannabis. It's going to be a criminal offense. It's a, it's a commercial transaction. So the prescribed quantities, the, the bill deals with specific quantities for each section, how, many, how much of the flowering plants you better have, how many seeds, how many grams of dried cannabis. Uh, it deals with trafficable and commercial quantities under the different offenses. So obviously these are now the more serious ones. If you have, you know, it's like you see on those border control programs where they find a car and it's stuffed with compressed cannabis, hundreds and hundreds of kilos. That's a very different situation from somebody who's got a little pouch in his pocket with two zoles. So here are the quantities. Um, 200 grams dried cannabis or cannabis equivalent is under the one section. Uh, commercial quantity under the other section is 300 grams of dried cannabis. These are not big amounts, eh? Under the section 42B, 800 grams dried cannabis or cannabis equivalent per adult. 50, so this is section 42B, as I recall, is the private use one. 1500 gram dried cannabis or cannabis equivalent per dwelling occupied by two or more adult persons. So it's quite funny. There's some sort of discrimination. If you're a single adult, you can have 800 grams. But if there's two of you in the house, you're going to have 1,500 grams. You actually can have less. Um, and then the commercial quantity is considered 1,000 grams per adult or 2,000 grams per dwelling. So if you've got a kilo of cannabis in your house, you're considered to be a seller and you can be prosecuted. So as you can see, these are small amounts. We're not talking here about hundreds of kilos or tons these are amounts that you could put in your in, 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 a, in a shoebox, which is probably where most of you keep it. 
Okay. <laughs> that is you very funny. It sounds the way that you speak that um, there is some knowledge, but I assume being a, a attorney, obviously you uh, you have got um, on, on on the right side to the experience. No, no, no. This is like it's like being a voyeur and looking through the window. Anyway, <laughs> so, so it, there are clear cut quantities that qualify the amounts which are either trafficable or commercial, and as you can see, those are not huge quantities. And in the various sections of the act, commercial quantities amount to class A offences, which means up to 15 years in prison. 15 years. It's drug trafficking. Okay, be very, very careful. So there are some legal issues with the cannabis for private purposes bill because it continues to enforce illegal commercial aspects of cannabis. There is, however, a specific exclusion of hemp in the definition of cannabis, as well as room for creation of further legislation dealing with the cultivation of hemp. So in the USA, they actually passed a separate agricultural law under the Agricultural Department for cultivation of hemp. And hemp, by the way, is used for many, many, many things. It's used for making clothing. I dealt last year with a company that uses hemp fiber in plastic articles to strengthen the plastic etc. So don't think of hemp just as a food ingredient. Hemp, in fact, has many uses. So I can well imagine that they will start regulating hemp under the Department of Agriculture. I think now called Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development as an agricultural crop, rather than cannabis, which will be always regulated under SAHPRA. And then, of course, this bill falls under the Department of Justice as opposed, as opposed to Department of Health or Department of Agriculture or the DTI. So therefore, government's view is still cannabis is a crime issue. Cannabis is not a crop for food consumption. So let's then talk about foodstuffs and cannabis and hemp and so on. So in the Foodstuffs Act, there's a, in the Foodstuffs Act, there's a definition of foodstuffs that I showed you early on. And it says that to be a foodstuff, it's something that is ordinarily eaten or drunk by a person or purporting to be suitable as such. And there we've got to think back. So what do people normally eat? So hemp, maybe. You know, hemp protein has been on the market for many, many years. I've seen, in fact, I personally have bought hemp protein at one of the, the, the health shops for a number of years, maybe 10 years already. It's been imported, no one said anything about it, but it's the protein, and I presume it's because it's a protein isolate, there's no THC in it, it's simply just a protein. The fact that it comes from hemp is neither yellow. Uh, but cannabis, no, cannabis is not eaten by anyone. You can look in codex, it's not generally regarded as safe. You can look at e the EU Food Safety Authority, etc., etc. Cannabis is not considered a foodstuff or an ingredient. Now, in Europe, they've been arguing about this for a long time. There's very little movement on this. Some European countries have taken their own steps. Um, in Cape Town, I was at a coffee shop where they were selling a coffee called Canna Coffee. I'm sorry if one of you is a supplier, uh, which amazingly is a product from Italy, which is illegal in Italy, but is being sold in South Africa. I can't even begin to fathom how that works. But it's a coffee that contains cannabis, but it's illegal in Italy, but it's sold in South Africa and its origin is Italy. So. The Foodstuffs, Cosmetics and Disinfectants Act also creates some criminal offences, fortunately not quite as severe as the ones under the Cannabis Bill. And it's an offence to sell or manufacture or import a foodstuff for sale, which is prohibited by any regulation. Or if you sell or manufacture or import for sale any foodstuff which contains a substance not present in any foodstuff in a normal, pure and sound condition, and then um, this exclusion won't apply to a substance not harmful or injurious to human health. So there are some things which are not specifically regulated, but if you add them, they can, and they're not harmful, you can have small quantities of them. But the problem that comes up is A4 above. It's a, a criminal offense to sell or manufacture, import for sale any foodstuff, the sale of which is prohibited by regulation. And unfortunately, the Medicines and Related Substances Act then declares CBD products to be Schedule Zero medicine, which means they cannot be sold as a foodstuff. So anything that contains CBD is potentially a big problem. 
Definitely anything that contains THC is a complete non-starter as a food ingredient. So can CBD or cannabis be used as a flavoring? So the soft drink regulation R1769 defines an additive as a substance which is specifically prepared for use in foodstuffs and intentionally added to soft drinks for one or more of the following purposes. And one of them is to make a soft drink more attractive to the consumer. The flavoring is an actual substance where the actual substance is not used, for example, CBD flavored. May not be qualified further by natural, synthetic, artificial, or naturally identical, or any other similar word. So could you say your drink is CBD flavored? Uh, maybe, but does it actually contain CBD? That's a different question. Because something can be CBD flavored, I suppose. I don't know what the flavor would be. It might be a terrible flavor. I don't know, but maybe people who want CBD like that flavor. You know, uh, some people like spicy foods and other don't. So can CBD or cannabis be used as a liquor flavoring? So under the Liquor Products Act, it says the following may be used in a liquor product. Soft drinks, flavorings of plant origin or extracts thereof, flavorings that are nature identical, herbs and natural extracts of herbs. So just reading up to that point, I would say CBD to the effect that it's not a psychoactive compound could be used as a flavor, as an ingredient in a liquor product, uh, probably hemp derived. But then they had published a draft amendment, which I haven't seen anything further of, but I presume it's still coming. And in that, they say that cannabis or anything derived therefrom is not a flavoring for the purposes of the liquor product. So they are trying to block B and C, which say flavorings of plant origin or extracts thereof by saying, but cannabis is not a flavoring. So therefore you can't use it in a liquor product. And yet you would have seen liquor products on the market that contain cannabis. What about using it as an additive? So a food additive is any substance regardless of its nutritive value that is not normally consumed as a foodstuff by itself and not normally used as a typical ingredient of the foodstuff, but which is added intentionally to a foodstuff for technological, including organoleptic purposes. So can it be used as an additive? Well, probably yes, but only if you, if you can find a way not to contravene the Medicines and Related Substances Act, which could be quite difficult, probably by using hemp and not cannabis. So, as in terms of foodstuffs, I think there is a slight opening for the use of hemp, but actual cannabis itself, which contains any THC, the door's closed. And remember what I said, there's a Drug Trafficking Act, makes it a very serious offence. There's a contravention potentially of the Foodstuffs Act, of the Medicines Related Substances Act. And if the cannabis bill comes through, you're potentially facing very serious jail time by having the cannabis and then dealing in it commercially, albeit in a foodstuff. So coming back to hemp, hemp of course is no or very, very low THC, and it's often used as an oil or a fiber, uh, but not typically for ingestion. Some products like hemp protein have been on sale and eaten for years, and I actually don't know what their CBD and THC content is. I never looked at it when I bought the product. They never said anything about it. So certain hemp derivatives may be legal as a foodstuff ingredient, but it will depend on the facts. And very importantly, you have to have COAs from reliable laboratories that tell you what the THC content is and what the CBD content is. There's no excuse. If you're buying a product and it turns out to contain THC in excess of the permitted amounts, you will be prosecuted. There's no such thing as, but I didn't know. The fact that you bought a drum of something and it says on the label, no THC is, not a, is proof of nothing. You need a COA from an accredited laboratory, either an ILAC accredited, accredited laboratory or a SANAS accredited laboratory, but certainly not something printed on somebody's printer at home, like I've seen. 
So that's the end of my presentation. I'm sorry to have put a damper on those that thought they're going to be entering this market and with lots of cannabis related products. Uh, but it seems like rather than opening the doors, the government looks like it's closing the door. Wow, Janusz, that is a mouthful. I mean, I have not seen, I hope it's because um, there is no questions or everybody feels like me in terms of, I think it's very, very clear that um, it can't be in food currently. You can't be selling something that it contains um, or you saying that it contains it. Um, I think the law is actually quite very specific and very clear right now about that. So yes. I see the question. And where you are in France, of course, it's it's the same as in South Africa, the situation. Yes. Look, yeah. let, let's not fool ourselves. You know, I go to like in Cape Town, there's a, a near my flat in Seapoint, there's a, like a market called the Moyo or Moyo, Mojo, M-O-J-O -O market. And there's yes. all these little stalls. And the first stall you get to is a guy selling cannabis products. And he's got chocolate, tea, drinks. And if I say to him, but how, uh, uh, but, uh, a vaping product, if I say to him, but do you realize what you're selling is illegal? His yeah. answer to me is everyone is doing it. Now, let me address that. So I consulted with a senior counsel, a very senior advocate yesterday on another matter for a client of mine. And what and, and the discussion turned to, but other companies don't comply with the regulations either. And there was a case a few years ago in the Cape, well, in fact, it went all the Supreme Court of South Africa called Century City Apartments versus someone, I can't remember what it was. And the judge of appeal, probably the best judge of the best president of the, of the appeal court we've had in many decades was a Judge Harams. Yes. And Judge Harams ruled that it's not a defense to breaking the law to say, but everybody else is also breaking the law. If you break the law, you will be judged on your actions and your actions alone. So, you know, I, I, I put it differently. I say, if people are breaking into cars on the side of the road, does that mean you should just walk up, smash a window and take somebody's hand back? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, it, it, it's for me, it's the, the whole thing, like you always say, you know, um, you can't just go and say, I don't know. You, especially if you are selling it for people to consume, you need to make sure. We've got two questions and thank you very much. Um, the first question is from uh, Anza Besser and she's asking, how is the Department of Justice enforcing the bill? The bill is still in a draft, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. The bill is not, in, it's not the law yet. So at the moment, the law is in fact the Drug Trafficking Act. And they've been they enforcing it the same way they've been enforcing it for the last however, 20, 30, 40 years. If you get caught with drugs, they take it to the police station, they weigh it. They send it to the forensic lab for analysis to determine what it is, and then they prosecute you. Uh, that's been the case as long as I can remember, probably from my school days, when there were people at our school who were caught with Dacha. That's how they dealt with them, and nothing's changed. The cannabis bill is just a bill. It's only going to become law once it's passed by parliament, and then regulations will be required. So one can imagine this will still take a year, year and a half before it's fully in effect. And then we've got a, another interesting question from Sylvia Bardnos. She's saying that many foods have pictures or even name cannabis, you know, on the contain. And then if you look at the ingredients, it only contains hemp seed. What is yeah. the consequences of this? Well, as you saw in one of my very first slides, that in fact, hemp is a variety of cannabis. So they're in yeah. fact not misleading the public. They can in fact say it. I mean, in a way, it's deceptive, but it's not really. Um, it's true. There is cannabis in there. It's like saying, I've got beef, but you don't say whether it's Angus or whether it's a Brahman or, you know, so, so I, I think they can do it. There are products out there which have nothing in them. They're just called cannabis. They actually don't have any hemp or cannabis or anything of the sort. It's just called cannabis. So that may be an issue in terms of labeling regulations and deception of the public or whatever, but it's not an yeah. issue as such in terms of the cannabis regulations or the Medicines and Related Substances Act regulations. It's not one of those issues. 
Definitely. And um, I think what's also important is, um, you know, like you said, should you want to go into this direction and, you know, want to use it under all the regulations and everything that you've guided us now, is that very important COA, you know, the certificate of analysis, so that you can yes. prove that your ingredients are according to what the, the, the um, act is of the regulation is saying. Janish, I also just want to ask, who is enforcing this? So that guy that you spoke about, um, that you said, you know, at the flea market, that said, no, who is actually supposed? Is it the, um, where can public go to if they see this or if they're concerned about this? So, and, so um, that person standing at the market, most likely the quantity of cannabis and THC on that stand, if I just look at that stand, probably yeah. exceeds the amounts under the Drug Trafficking Act. And in fact, if there was energy for it, I mean, I mean, Becky Keller is chasing people off the beach because they're kite surfing. <laughs> Instead, we should be going into Moyo Mall and arresting this guy for, for, for drug trafficking. Yeah. So the same people that would catch people that are the illegal shabines, there's in reality no difference between an illegal shabeen and a guy selling illegal cannabis in this way. So firstly, it would be the police um, in terms of the Drug Trafficking Act. The, the, the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority could also go after this person uh, on the basis of transgression of the Medicines and Related Substances Act using the same inspectors that go into pharmacies and into discams and, and look at the registers for the sale of scheduled products. Uh, they're not doing it at the moment. I suppose they're too busy with ivermectin and, and lots of other issues. Yes. Um, but certainly they would be also able to do this. I think one of the problems with them doing it is that the products themselves don't state what quantity of THC they have, what quantity of CBD they have, etc. So they would have to take it away and send it for analysis. Uh, which may be why Sakhra are saying, well, just leave these people alone. We're busy regulating things. But if there was a, let's say there was a manufacturer and he had a warehouse full of this stuff, yes. they could very well go there. Um, you know, in order to produce products with cannabis in South Africa, you need to have a GMP production facility yes, under yes. The, the Medicines Related Substances Act and the yes. Pharmacy Act. You need a GMP production facility. You need a pharmacist in control of that facility. And there's a whole lot of requirements. So I have in the past consulted with big companies that want to get into this market and they have to set up this type of infrastructure so that they can be properly duly registered. They can buy the cannabis and the hemp from people that have cultivation licenses. They then have a GMP facility where they can process and pack and then they distribute it as a CAMS. And then, you, then you're good to go. Yeah. Remember, cams can be sold in a, in a supermarket. You can sell cams at a spa. It's not that you can't. It's just that it's got to comply with those requirements. Absolutely. Is, I just want to find out from the audience, um, is there still anybody that's got questions? And, um, okay, I see one more coming through. And it's from Sonia. She's saying, seeing that you cannot use cannabis products in, uh, in liquor, um, and uh, I think, let me just see, um, Sonia, I'm going to unmute you and then you can ask your question um, to Yanis directly if I'm not understanding the way that you've typed it. So I'm unmuting you, so if possible, can you ask the question to Yanis directly, if you can just unmute yourself. Thank you. Hi, Yanis. Um, <laughs> Yanis, my question is that I'm um, seeing that you indicated that any cannabis products cannot be used um, in your in the public or even in your car does it mean that if i have a cool drink product that is registered as a schedule zero um, complementary medicine but in a cool drink form that i cannot consume it in a public area or in my car no 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 so once the cannabis bill is passed and becomes law obviously <coughs> it's not illegal to use something that's permitted under the medicines and related substances act so if you have a product that's registered as a CAMS or has got a CAMS application, then you'll be able to continue using it because it's in fact legal to use it. What we are talking about here is products that are unregistered and are just 
cannabis or a chocolate with cannabis in it, etc. Okay, awesome. I'm sure that that answer your question. I see there's no more questions coming from the floor. So, <laughs> Janusz, thank you so yes. much once again for a very, very comprehensive presentation. I'm sure of it. Um, you know, this is so clear for everybody and there's a clear understanding. And like I said, um, this recording will be made available on our website um, with the link. And um, yeah, I want to ask you guys to have a look on our website, uh, foodfocus.co.za. Um, at the top, you will see resources. And then under resources, there's a button that says webinars. And um, 